Hi guys! It took me quite a while, so I am really happy that I can finally introduce you the second evolution of my DIY SLS 3D printer. I will show you what are the main design changes I have done between these two printers and also will try to explain you what were the main reasons which led me to make them. It was nearly a year for me to move from the first prototype towards something I believe I can call the release candidate version, uh, which means that once I will finish all my testings, I will open it to you and share the documentation. The main concept of the printer stays the same. It means that you got the bottom part of the printer and the top part of the printer, which you can open and actually to get direct access to the powder reservoir as well as print chamber. I chose this approach because I like that I have really enough space for taking out the powder cake once the print is finished. First design change I'd like to point out relates to the powder reservoir and the print chamber shape. Although the overall dimensions of the both chambers stay the same like in the first prototype, uh, I had to make rounded corners inside them because of problems with the ceiling. You can imagine that if you have really right tight corner, it's problematic to seal it somehow perfectly and to avoid the leakage of the powder. It's important to mention that powder leakage is problematic not just from the perspective of the mess and so on, but also uh, that it can cause the layer shifting while printing. You can image it on the example of sand. If you'll put it on the box and then will you make a hole in this box, the sand will go out and it will cause the movements of everything what's in this sand. And that's actually the problem which can cause the layer shifting while printing. When speaking about the chamber ceiling, I had to change my approach completely. Not only with regard to the shape of the chamber, but also the ceiling material and ceiling construction. In the first prototype, I used quite simple wiper ceiling, which was made from the rubber silicone, which was silicone glued to the plate. The problem with the simple ceiling approach was that when the bed went up and down, it behaved like a wiper, which means that the ceiling did this and that. And that was the problem because in the midpoint where the ceiling was just changing its position, uh, it made quite a huge pressure into the walls of the chamber and build plate itself tend to move inside. And again, that relates to possible layer shifting, which we definitely didn't want to see there. Thanks to the people from my Discord server, I got an inspiration in EOS solution which is using some kind of spring mechanism which pushed the ceiling towards the walls of the chamber. And that's actually approach I've chosen. So finally, uh, there is not a silicon rubber for the ceiling, but there is some kind of a technical felt which has really lower uh, friction coefficient uh, as compared to the silicon. So that's the solution which is in this version and actually I'm really happy that it works pretty well. Next part of my design I decided to change also relates to the precision of the movements in the Z1 and Z2 axis, which means the powder reservoir and the print chamber axis. In the first prototype, there were for linear guidance used common smooth rods of 8 mm in diameter accompanied by linear bearings and trapezoidal screw with nut to make the moves up and down. It's definitely not the bad way how to do it, but also not the best. If you will image that in the powder reservoir chamber is 8.5 something liters of the powder, if you fill it completely full, it weighs something. And from this perspective, I realized that the stiffness of this mechanism is not good enough. Therefore, I decided to replace it with precise 12 millimeter renal guides accompanied by ball screw. 
It gave me the expected enhancements in rigidity of, of my approach, but it also gave me one big problem, and this is wobble. I will not go in deep details of this problem because there are many videos on internet dealing with it because it's quite commonly known from the FDM printers. But the main problem is that the ball screw is much stiffer than the trapezoidal one. So when it's rotating, it's making this kind of, this kind of wobble and you are unable to fix it in any clamp or something anyhow because it's really, really stiff. And you can image that if this screw is wobbling like this, it will be transferred also into the build plate. And again, you have a problem with the print quality in terms of Z-axis surface and layer shifting. So I had another problem on the table I had to deal with. After some research, I decided to take a pieces of inspiration from Wobble X approach, which I really like. But the problem is that it was designed for the FDM printers and the Wobblex principle depends on gravity, which I can't depend here because I need to be tight in both direction, up and down, up and down, because there is the mend friction in between uh, sealing uh, of the print chamber and powder chamber. But finally, I sorted it out. It looks like this and it works pretty well. So if the printer is moving with the beds up and down, you can see nearly nothing because these movements of the balls are nearly microscopic. But what's more important for me is that the bed is quite nice and rigidly moving without any tendency for wobbling. If you like my project and don't want to miss anything, please subscribe here and also join my Discord server. Another area I had to place my focus on was the recoating mechanism. You can image how important is this assembly in the SLS printing because the quality of each layer directly affects the quality of the whole print. Maybe you can remember from my previous video that I changed my approach from counter mechanism uh, to the simple blade. The reason to change it is not because of wrong approach how to do it. Uh, it was just a bit more complicated than the simple blade moving uh, mechanism. In the first prototype, the blade was made out of the 3 mm thick aluminum, which was working quite well. The problem started in here. Even I used the same approach, I had quite a big problems with the vibrations of the blade, because the blade is connected to the belt just on the one side of the original guys. So you can image if I started to pull the bell uh, on one side, on the other side, because this blade was not rigid enough or start small vibrations. And of course it affected the quality of the layer again. So I decided to make a blade thicker, which means that now is it from the, I think, eight millimeter thick aluminum. I also changed a bit the bottom shape of the blade to uh, have better quality of the surface of the recoated layer. And it actually sorted out all my vibration problems because the blade itself now acts also as a stiff gantry between the linear rails. Another problem I had with the recoating assembly was the belt itself. Yes, it was temperature resistant but it's not temperature stable, which means that under the higher temperatures, uh, the belt will shorten quite a bit and it make different tension of the belt when it's cold and when it's hot. And it was quite a big issue because it overloaded the motor and it was not good for the pulleys, for the belt and for everything. In my first prototype, there were also like three or four pulleys used in the way of the belt, uh, which I definitely wanted to avoid because it's just make uh, higher friction while belt is uh, while belt is moving, and therefore I decided I want to have just the motor on one side and the pulley on the other side, and. That's why I thought how to make this pulley not only the simple pulley, but also how to use it for tensioning the belt. And this is my solution. This approach makes me sure that the belt tension is equal under any condition. I mean, if it's cold or if it's hot. 
If someone would ask me what I think is a really complicated thing on SLS printing, I would say for sure the temperature regulation. Especially the temperature regulation on the surface finish of the each layer, which had to be heated up properly and evenly before the laser starts scanning. These temperatures should be somewhere in between plus minus 1 degree Celsius from the optimum, which is somewhere around 174-75 degree Celsius for PA12. And it's not the easy task if you will image that you are regulating the temperature using these halogen bulbs. Here is the final solution of my release candidate version. And here you can see how it looked like in my first prototype. The main difference is in the length of the uh, halogen infrared tubes I used uh, because it was a problem to just buy in the shop uh, the different lengths. Actually you can buy 118 millimeters or 78 millimeters long bulbs. These are the 118. Uh, but if you will image that the print bed is 175 by 175 I had a big problems with so-called cold corners and therefore I had to add these four halogen bulbs into each corner. And it was the point where the printer was able to print something actually. Uh, until that it was just failing layer by layer. That's why I was really happy that I was able to find companies which were able to uh, customize every parameter of this quartz infrared bulbs for me. It means the length, it means the wattage, it means the sockets, it means everything. It's really, really perfect. So here I am using two lengths of the bulbs, the shorter ones here and the longer ones here. So I can cross them without overheating them. And the outline of these bulbs is now equal to the total area of the print bed. Although I tried to think deeply about everything I was doing in regards to the design, uh, there were also some underestimation from my side, like the behavior of the overpowder bin. Uh, you can see this is the overpowder bin uh, from my first prototype, which looked like this after I think uh, one or two prints. Uh, it's completely deformated on this side uh, because uh, it's really hot in the, in the chambers, of course. I came up with a couple of solutions how to uh, make it better and how to protect this plastic part from the heat, uh, but it will always uh, finish like this. Yes, yeah, you can say why is it from plastic, it's just because I really want to keep this printer DIY as much as possible and because of this shape of the uh, overpowder bin, it wouldn't be easy to make it from the steel or from the aluminum sheet or whatsoever. So that's why. Therefore I changed my approach completely and now it's no overpowder bin on the side of the printer, just here underneath. Powder is going through the whole printer into this overpowder bin, uh, which you can just simply pull out like this and take it out completely if you wish to and uh, then just simply uh, press it back like this and to use this uh, security knob to uh, keep it in place. Because I decided to open my plans to all of you after testing, I also had to start to think about my and your safety. So for these reasons, I added two safety switches in the printer. One is here in the uh, top frame and another one is here, uh, protect, protecting the overpowder bin from removing it. This will directly switch off the laser when you will try to open the lid or pull out the overpowder bin. We have also made a big changes on the electronics hardware and on the software side. But as these are quite a huge topics, I decided to keep them for the separate video. So that's it. And if you haven't seen the video how the first prototype performed in terms of printing, let's check it out. See you.